Hello everyone, my name is Joshua Gilliland, attorney blogger on Bowtie Law, and with me today is Howard Reisner, CEO of Planet Data, and we're going to talk about legal education, the future, and how to survive the present, and what we think will help law students be good attorneys in the future. Howard, how are you today? All right, good afternoon. Very well, Josh. Thanks. So, Howard, uh, I'm a McGeorge grad. Where did you go to law school? Went to George Washington. Yeah. Very nice. Very nice. I, I have fond memories of being in California's capital and uh, very interesting times back then. Uh, but law students today are facing a whole bunch of crisis, crises from getting jobs, what needs to go into legal education. And did you check out the Brooklyn, uh, excuse me, the New York Times article last week on uh, the Brooklyn Law School? and what they're doing to try to move ahead to the future. No, I did see that. Um, it was well publicized, the uh, Brooklyn Law School, uh, the article about the fact that they're going to, starting with, I guess, next year's incoming class, going to offer a substantial uh, reduction in the tuition. Yeah, I believe it was, uh, they're trying to keep it around 54000 a year, which, you know, for me, that was about what I, you know, paid going through law school uh, each year, and was substantial, but they're trying to do that. And I think I was University of Iowa and University of Arizona. We're also trying similar measures and trying to cut costs, uh, which is different than some of the other solutions other law schools have done uh, in trying to um, uh, work with incoming classes and get people to be successful law students and successful attorneys. Uh, what are some of the other measures law schools are taking to help uh, prospective students? I think uh, most of the t uh, schools are at least trying as best they can to offer more financial aid uh, so that the uh, students come out um, potentially with less debt uh, than they otherwise might. But nonetheless, with the cost of legal education today, um, you know, unless the package is enormous, uh, you have a lot of students coming out graduating with, with six-figure debt. Yeah. And uh, so that's one option. The other one, uh, which has been tried, um, not necessarily successfully, is to reduce class sizes, that's another option. So when I went to McGeorge, we were broken up into three sections and each section had 90 students. And there was substantial attrition at midterms and then after finals at the end of the year. And by the time I graduated law school, there were the class was about 194 people, uh, including the uh, night students at that point in time in 2001. So. I don't necessarily disagree with reducing class size as opposed to letting a bunch of people in who are going to fail out. Uh, but it, it's definitely a fascinating uh, thing looking at the money. Yeah, I don't think, by the way, Josh, I don't think it's failing out. I don't think these students are it's not an issue of failing out. I don't think the failure rate um, has increased. I don't think the students going into law school today are any less competent. Uh, if any, so they might even be more competent. And the fact is, is it's just less high paying jobs and less jobs overall available, uh, the, the pool of jobs has not kept up with the pool of, of graduates. Well, that and the practice is changing. When you look at the self-help uh, technology out there that, you know, where you can download forms and you don't need a business attorney to help you with a contract, even though if you are putting together a complex co a corporation or you're writing a substantial will, I would have a lawyer help you with that as opposed to a self-help form. A lot of people are using that. Uh, in Palo Alto, there's basically kind of like a cafe self-help firm that people can use on University Avenue that they go in, their little iPads and computers set up that they can type away on, and attorneys come out and can talk with them. And it's kind of that uh, Apple Store model of the practice of law, which is fascinating and different. But even again, if you just look at it from a, the economic standpoint, um, if you have more lawyers graduating, uh, you know, you don't have to destroy all legal work. All you have to do is, is, is knock down the, the revenue model and the profits at the, at the margin. And so from a, you know, a marginal cost scenario, if you have technology now where somebody even starting up a company can go to, to some kind of online facility or can go to a place like you're talking about and get sort of the first cut done. Right? In the same vein, I saw some technology um, demonstrated to me a couple of weeks ago, uh, fairly sophisticated in terms of contract um, management, life cycle management, um, creating new contracts, creating new forms for the corporate level. So 
it's not going to eliminate an attorney, but by the time it gets to an attorney for review, maybe that first 60 or 70 percent of, of, of actual native work has now been brought and the attorney doesn't have as many hours to put into it and can't charge as much. Yeah, even though the still funnel product is still worth something, and I think there's a very good argument to be made that those self-help websites are actually increasing the access to justice for a lot of folks and being able to uh, otherwise use a will because too many people die in test state without wills and it's a mess. Too many people have you know, uh, very strange uh, partnerships as opposed to an LLC. So I do think there's an argument to be made that those sites actually do help uh, substantially. But there are those who, you know, you should probably involve an attorney at some point uh, to really dig into this. Which brings us to, you know, the present. On this past Sunday, I had a car breakdown. So dropped the car off at the shop, and I took Uber home. And my Uber driver is an incoming law student. And he is retaking the SAT at the request of the school, even though he's already accepted, to try to get more scholarship money so he could lower the amount that he has to borrow to get through his first year of law school. And I don't particularly have happy memories of taking the LSAT, and I felt bad for him having to do that, but that just shows uh, some of the, the trials that young people are going through as they're going through law school right now. Well, and that's some of the pressures that the law school um, are facing. I'm on the advisory board of, of, uh, of my law school, um, and so you have a, a much smaller applicant pool, for example, now than even five or six years ago. I think it's down 35 or 40 percent, which is quite substantial. Um, and so there are less um, less applicants uh, at the very top of the uh, of the of the pile to choose from, and so once accepted, the schools are doing their best to convince those top applicants to go to with them, because of course that then keeps their scores up, which keeps their rankings up, which makes them stronger comp uh, compared to their peers. And so what they're doing is they're basically going out and competitively bidding. For these clients, uh, for these students, and there's only so much amount of money that's in these endowments uh, that they can continue to do that. Yeah, it's a challenge because you gotta have pay all those professors that are working who are helping. So it's 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 just a huge economic issue in being able to have the life cycle be sustainable. Well, let's let's shift gears and talk about the skills that lawyers that should be learning when they're in law school, because my alumni prided itself on creating work-ready attorneys, people who knew how to do document review, people who were ready to take a deposition, people who were ready to go to a case management conference. And I had a good friend who went to a very elite, well-thought-of law school, that the type that trains Supreme Court justices and federal judges. And he described his education as if you had an ER doctor who in medical school only learned how to do a heart transplant from a baboon to a human being. That skill would be completely useless in the emergency room, and every ER patient would die because the ER doctor would only know this one weird exception. And that was his experience uh, with what he learned. And so making things practical, I think, is a big thing. And what are your thoughts on some of the practical uh, skills that new lawyers should have upon graduating law school. So um, I absolutely agree with your conclusion, and it was uh, fine when there were um, was more uh, demand than supply for uh, schools to be teaching legal theory, and then the uh, young attorneys could learn on the job, and the clients would in fact pay for it, um, and it was built into the billing, and everybody was happy. But I think that era is over, um, and as a result of that, with few exceptions, there are you know certainly. Um, you know, some incredibly brilliant people that will always be needed. Uh, and uh, I think mostly you're looking at a scenario where, where, where law students and young attorneys need to have, as you said, um, work-ready skills that can be, can be implemented immediately and make themselves more valuable both to their firms and their clients. Uh, I think, number one, from a, a domain expertise, I think if you come in and you're not just saying, I'm here, you know, teach me what to do, and you come in with domain expertise in some of the, you know, the growth areas in, in, the, in the global economy. Um, you know, whether it's uh, uh, communications or technology, um, engineering, health sciences, uh, medical uh, uh, areas, 
um, um, privacy, uh, um, international, uh, all of those areas are areas that are going to be in demand and they're going to need people who have domain expertise. The other, the other piece of this is, is to come in and be um, technologically competent so that not only can you be an efficient uh, a, a worker in use of your time, but in addition to that, since all these areas I just mentioned all entail some degree of privacy, um, of communication, of technology, um, how are you going to interact with your client who is developing a biotechnology platform or somebody who's developing a social media app or, um, or is doing an entrepreneurial startup um, in high tech? How are you going to interact with them and give them the appropriate advice if you don't understand the technology yourself? And that is such a huge issue, and I've seen it at some of the really successful educational conferences with lawyers who are corporate counsel at big companies and litigators at successful firms that have this idea that, oh, we have people who do that for us and figuring out how to have things frigidly image or how to talk to the client. And it's like, time, time out. This is your duty of competency that you're talking about here. You can't say the little people will do it for me because that's you. You have to know what your client does. You have to know how to, from anything from uh, having an effective custodial interview to determine the data map and to be able to determine what needs to be preserved and what doesn't need to be preserved so you don't have some horrific situation with spoliation because you didn't know the questions to ask or more importantly what I think would be the duty of candor to a court. Because if you're showing up and you have no idea how to explain to the judge what's happening in the case because you think there's supposed to be tech people who just magically make things happen, uh, that's in the past. Lawyers need to know this. Uh, they don't need to be programmers, but they need to be able to know how to communicate it and understand what's at least uh, said to them by their clients. Right. And then you take a look, for example, there's more and more trans, you know, international transnational work. And I just can't think of almost any scenario now where an attorney is not won't be required to understand um, privacy, compliance, security, uh, data transfer, data storage issues, um, no matter what you do, even if you're uh, if you're doing it, you know, transactional um, um, situation. And I, I just think there's no longer you can just say, well, you know, uh, Susan does that for us. In light of everything that's happened from NSA to uh, the different security breaches that have taken place from big companies to small, that lawyers need to be aware of this because we have a cloud-connected world. And I remember from the PFIC conference that uh, the Windows mobile devices, 70% of the data that's on those phones is connected to a cloud. So it's not actually on the device, it's connected through the device to a cloud. You need to know, have an idea how that works and being able to go, this is how we preserve it. It's not necessarily going through the phone, it's getting to the cloud in order to get the data. And lawyers need to at least understand that. Well, let's talk about some of the skills that I think um, should graduating attorney should have from law school and I'd like to get your thoughts. Now I'm a huge proponent of knowing how to do document review, knowing how to do depo prep. Uh, I think those are you know, work ready skills or more basic stuff from filling out a CMC form or case management form that that's what we have in California. I'm not sure what you guys have in New York. Uh, not everybody teaches that. What are your thoughts? I think, again, until I think 2008 when the, I think the, the legal world changed, though I'm not sure that everybody still has acknowledged it, um, but, but we're six years past that now. Um, I, you always have the idea that well, we're a national law program and we teach theoretical law as opposed to these other schools which are local schools which teach practice ready. Uh, and I think that the, the real reality for a lot of these national programs um, is that they're going to have to adjust their curricula um, and um, their focus so that they have students graduating that are practice ready and put in programs, um, internships, clinics, practicums, things like that. They're going to allow them to do the kinds of, I'm ready to go to work the first day that you just suggested. And not a lot of law schools have like e-discovery classes. You know, my alumni does and they do a very good job of it's taking a case from beginning to trial. And so they, at the end of it, they're actually using trial presentation software. 
in the local federal courthouse to argue something. So it's, it's like a NIDA case that they have, and it's glorious because the students are logging in, they're doing doc review, they're tying to some of the other programs, and it's literally walking through the entire life cycle. I don't know how many others are doing that, but I would strongly encourage and hope that the first time you hear about a review application is not the first day at work. You need to know the basics and how to do uh, issue spotting and tagging uh, you know, prior to graduation. Well, I think in the last, if you go back three or four years, I think it was literally a handful of, of um, law schools that were offering that kind of program. Clearly to me, and I spend a lot of time out in the field and meeting with people, I can't give you a number, but it's substantially more. There's more focus on that, and it's certainly not a handful anymore. And I think those schools are doing the right thing. Fully agree. Now, a couple months ago, there was this huge push. And, you know, I've seen in some of the articles about changing law school to a two-year program. And I have strong feelings on that. I was wondering what your take is on it. Well, you know, the, of course, the natural economic theory would be that the law schools don't want that because they need three years of tuition. Um, and it's for most universities right now, at least, the law school is a profitable um, profitable enterprise, they don't have a football team, um, and, um, and, and it's, it's the next 50 students, it's all, it's all revenue-based with no additional expenditure. Nonetheless, I think that a, a two-year program, uh, and I've had a discussion about that recently, um, would basically just take up all mandatory courses, would leave little time for electives. Uh, we were talking earlier, Josh, about the fact that if you can develop some domain expertise in some of these areas, it's going to make you more valuable. If your first two years are taken up with mandatory courses in the second year, you're, you know, you're basically now down um, you know, to some of the, the second year mandatory courses, um, you know, tax and a trust in estates or whatever it is, uh, pre prepare for the bar exam. You really have little time to explore any of this, and you certainly are not going to have much time for any kind of clinical or practical application during the year where you should be using that third year to get some real life from um, that background. Yeah, and I agree. I, I do not think it should change to a two-year program. I'll go on the record with that. But I do think we need to have more clinical uh, programs in the third year, more hands-on, practical-type courses that they could take. Uh, I really enjoyed my third year of law school because I got to take what I wanted. You know, I took First Amendment law and was able to dive into that. I was able to jump into other practice areas in federal court and others that I care deeply about that have helped my practice. So saying it's just going to be this like two-year shop where you graduate and you know you have all the mandatory classes, and then you go take the bar. I, I don't agree with that. But skill building and networking and you know, if your law school is located in the capital of your state, there better be one heck of an internship program with the different state agencies. And also, if you have a large federal presence, hope that that's taking place as well to get people uh, hands on skill building and hopefully a paycheck uh, when they graduate as well. Right. And one other point I think we have not addressed yet, um, just from the standpoint, if you made it a two year program versus a three year program, it may in fact encourage more people to go to law school. And the last thing we need now are more young attorneys coming out in the marketplace. Yeah, there was, we'd mentioned this earlier, there was the Above the Law article a couple days ago or last week that said that the class of 2011 was at 83% employment. Okay, 83% better than, than like 50, but Lord knows what kind of incomes that that, that class has. If, they actually, if they're counting people who are now in roofing as being employed as opposed to the practice of law. So like those are important numbers to know. You know, if they are working at a fast food joint and you're counting that as total employment, that's not true. So like it's always good to, to know the breakdown of those numbers. But there's a lot of people who are hurting from you know, six-figure debt who aren't employed. Right. And the reality is, and this is just, a, this is, I don't know the exact numbers, but it's really factual, the number of, of what's called big law, big ticket uh, entry positions is substantially down from four or five years ago. There's just no, no question about that. And those, those were basically, that was sort of the golden ticket 
that a lot of people went to school with and were willing to incur six-figure debt because they thought that they were gonna they were gonna be the ones that were gonna win that lottery. There are a lot less winners now in the lottery. Now there are other states that are you know addressing this in creative ways. I believe it was Nebraska that was offering major incentives for you know young attorneys to move out to rural parts of the state because people do need legal services and to help people out of debt and to look ahead and debt forgiveness, that sort of thing. So there, there are like some of the public sector and access to justice solutions that people see because we will always need good attorneys, just as you will always need doctors and accountants. People need help with the law. And so there will always be a need, but being able to, you're not going to get that job for 160 and be a partner in five years, you know, and if you are, it's going to be at a much smaller firm at you know fifty grand less, and that that's that's hard for a lot of folks. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that that people who want to be be attorneys, um, you know, I think a lot of them who who if they did not have this kind of, um, of indebtedness and we have to figure out ways to get them through law school or help them get through law school without this level of debt. I think there, number one, I absolutely agree with you. There are many people underserved around this country that are not getting legal representation and and need it. Um, and I think a lot of people would be happy um, living, attorneys would be happy living at a, a, you know, a much lower income level with a much better quality of life, and they would be very happy doing that, um, you know, as long as they didn't have enormous amount of debt to pay off. Um, and, you know, every one of these, uh, you know, every one of these jobs comes with its potential, you know, golden, golden handcuff. Yeah, if you owe, you know, $1,200 a month in your student loan repayments, that knocks out rent or the ability to buy a house when you basically have a mortgage payment already in your student loan debt before you know destroying the opportunity to go out and have enough uh, to live normally. And I mean, this varies state to state. Um, you know, to be um, middle income in the Bay Area, you do need to be making six figures. And some of the other big cities, that's that's the same challenge. In other parts of the country, that kind of income would put you into the upper class. So there's always that location matters factor. Uh, but it's, we need good attorneys. We need people who love the law, who want to help others, who want to make the world a better place. And, you know, I mean, today's April 15th. And while everyone's focusing on tax day, you know, it's, it's the day Lincoln died. You know, and there's an example of the lawyer who really made a difference in this country. And we need people who, who believe in that to be attorneys and they shouldn't fear massive debt and unemployment uh, deterring them from helping others. Well, I absolutely agree. Yeah. I wasn't aware that today was a day Lincoln died. Though. That was interesting. That was before the federal income tax. You can't blame it on that. Yeah, that and it's also the anniversary of the Titanic sinking. So April 15th has, uh, you know, a, you know, a double whammy that in, in 1865 Lincoln's death, and then in 1912, it was at 2.20 a.m., uh, the sinking of the Titanic. So uh, very negative connotations with this day, in addition to massive stress that people are feeling across the country as they uh, finish their taxes. Wow. So with that, Howard, uh, I always enjoy our talks and look Thank forward you. to Now, uh, is it possible to see you sometime soon at an upcoming conference? Are you guys going to be available? Um. Not sure. I have to check with Laura. Okay, and we will. Uh, well, again, we do, uh, we do attend. You know, we do attend a fair amount of conferences. Um, so we should we should see if our schedules um, sync up or I'll make them sync up. Sounds good. Well, I look forward to seeing you in person soon. And uh, everyone, thank you for tuning in today.